Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just want to welcome everyone to the uh, AOSPINE North America uh, Fellows kickoff webinar. Uh, unfortunately, I've been pranked and my video is not working, so I apologize. Um, apparently, I was so good looking it broke the camera. Um, uh, that does happen, but this is a picture of me. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Kleinberg. I am the chair of the uh, AOSPINE North America Fellowship Committee. Um, and I just want to get, uh, just to uh, kick off this webinar first with telling you a little bit about uh, the, the uh, AO North America Spine Fellowship Committee, um, the um, uh, a fellowship that you're a part of. And then, uh, and then I want to kick it off to start thinking about what is it you guys need to get out of your first year in fellowship and how to make the most out of this year. And so for that, I've invited two of my former fellows, uh, Anath Eliswarapu and uh, Richard Hurley, uh, both of whom you can see their beautiful faces in, in, uh, in your screen. So just to start off, the AOSPI North America Fellowship Committee is uh, composed of myself as a chair, Dan Gelb is our past chair, and then we're surrounded by uh, real experts in the field with uh, Ryan Spiker, Matt Coleman, Sam Cho, and Jeff Mullen, and all of them help uh, form the Fellowship Committee, which helps selection of fellowship sites and also helps guide uh, some of the curriculum that you guys are going to share in this whole year. You're a part of a very prestigious group of fellows. Uh, so there are 35 sites around uh, North America uh, with 106 uh, fellows. And so you, we all, you know, we get this question often, where does AO Spine fit into all these other uh, 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 societies that we're a part of, including NAS, uh, the AANS, AOA, uh, SRS. And uh, AO Spine is really not another society, but it's an association of like-minded surgeons from not just North America, but from around the globe, Latin America, Middle East, Asia Pacific, and Europe. And the AO Spine Global Community is over 32,000 associates and 6,400 members across the five regions. And if you look here, you can see that North America is one of the smaller members Asia Pacific is nearly three times as big. Europe and South America and Latin America are nearly twice as big as, uh, as our own sites. You know, the AO is responsible for education, uh, concept, program development, uh, and we run a, a variety of educational events in various formats. Uh, we're, we uh, help uh, educate through faculty development. Uh, we do uh, online or in-person courses uh, for fellows, we do webinars, and then we do fellowship awards, awarding people to travel to different locations. Now, obviously, you can imagine a lot of these things have changed under uh, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. So AOSPI membership, so I want to uh, challenge you all to please make sure you uh, 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 register for your membership. As an AOSPI fellow, uh, your membership is complimentary for the first two years. It gives you access to educational videos, online journals, Global Spine Journal, and much, much more. And um, it gives you access to this AO Spine global community. Now, uh, Chi Lam, I'm sure, has sent out instructions on how to register. Uh, please contact your don't have any questions, but the registration process uh, is, uh, is quite straightforward. Here's what the AO Spine website looks like if you haven't logged into, into it already. Um, and this allows you to connect to the world and beyond and gives you access and information on the Global Spine Congress. Uh, and you can log in in that uh, top right corner. And when you do so, uh, you can, uh, that login then gives you uh, access to your dashboard. And this is uh, your dashboard and this gives you free resources, resources and personal profile settings. And it gives you access to a whole host of things, including the, the clinical library and tools and then this educational content. And the educational content gives you case-based uh, information, discussions, recorded webinars, uh, videos, uh, and can even get a view access to your events uh, that you're gonna register for. And then the clinical library gives you all the information to the Global Spine Journal um, uh, and other journals so you can gather information uh, uh, here in one place and one stop. Uh, and there's some arrows. It gives you access to the Global Spine Journal, the European Spine Journal, the Journal of Neurosurgery Spine and Spine, and then some discounted prescriptions uh, for the Journal of Orthopedic Surgery, which, and again, these may not be important to you this year, 
but next year uh, after graduation, these may be more important for you to uh, continue to get access to and access at a reasonable price, a reasonable rate in one place. The Global Spine Journal um, is the official scientific publication of AO Spine. I would encourage all of you to submit your uh, manuscripts online uh, at the Global Spine Journal. Uh, it is a, um, a peer-reviewed, well-cited uh, journal uh, and uh, has excellent readership and, uh, and uh, um, uh, should be encouraged for you, not just this year, but beyond as a place for you to publish your data and research. This is not the only fellow webinar, and so we are going to continue to do these Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you'll receive a link to register, and then please plan to participate. Um, we, uh, can, we do keep track of who participates, uh, and we do want you online to help us uh, help you in your educational uh, um, uh, year. The fellows webinar topics this year, so October 13th, Dan Galb is going to take the lead looking at degenerative spondylolisthesis, talking about different ways that that can be fixed, um, surgical, non-surgical options, and, and then different procedures that we can think of. November 10th, Ryan Spiker is going to lead a discussion looking at the use of interbody cages in degenerative lumbar surgery. Um, what kind of cages make the most sense and uh, how do those work and uh, uh, what may, what's most relevant for you and for your patients? And then on December 15th, we're going to talk about cervical laminoplasty and Sham Cho is going to take the lead uh, with his fellows. There's also uh, required courses that we want you to attend. And um, this year, we're going to do an online fellows course. Unfortunately, with uh, uh, the coronavirus, it's precluded us from doing uh, anything in person. Uh, we're going to do, uh, uh, st stay tuned for that registration link. But the goal is to do that every Thursday uh, from the end of September into October. And we're going to cover topics including cervical trauma, cervical radiculopathy, uh, CSM, thoracal lumbar trauma, lumbar stenosis, and attaining global spinal alignment. Um, and uh, Rick Bransford and Ryan Spiker are leading that um, event. And then Fellows Forum, every year um, uh, we've been doing a, a Fellows Forum in Banff. Uh, and this year, we're just not sure how that's gonna work. And so uh, whether or not there'll be a live or a virtual event, uh, we will sort out uh, probably along with the rest of the world. It depends on vaccine development and all the rest. And so hopefully we'll be able to do that in person. It's a, it's a really fun time and a great time to, to interact with your fellows and uh, with fellows from around the country. And then research requirements and deadlines. So all fellows are required to complete a research project during the year. The fellows and fellowship directors uh, will in, uh, receive an invitation. Uh, and then we want you to present your research at the fellows forum and whether or not that'll be in person or virtual again will yet to be determined. Um, and the fellows that attend the forum, the only requirement is uh, that you're an AO fellow and that you have an abstract for presentation so that we can see that. Um, and then uh, the important deadlines, the fellow abstract deadline is January 31st. Uh, and that uh, date is fast approaching, I promise, I promise. And there's also a self-assessment survey that we'd like you to complete and that will be sent out in September of April. Um, the fellows receive a link to the survey and it's essentially what surgeries do you feel comfortable uh, participating in and, and to what extent. Um, and then uh, once you complete that uh, survey, we will give you access to an AO Spine Master Series book of your choice and you'll get a link and, uh, and then we'll be happy to send that book to you. There's also a fellows handbook. Uh, so you, uh, the fellows and directors all receive an electronic copy. And it gives you a perspective of the AO Foundation and AO Spine. It talks about your expectations, some tips and tricks, important dates and deadlines, how to stay involved after fellowship, uh, if that's something you'd like to do. And then also a fellowship reading list with links to full articles on kind of what we feel are the most relevant articles that you should know and have a sense of during your fellowship. So uh, please be on the look for that. If you don't have that uh, or need access, please uh, feel free to email me or uh, Chi Lam, and we will direct you to the right location. I also want to give uh, a special shout out to the Depew Synthes Clinical Relations Team. And so the Clinical Relations Team is a, our direct liaison uh, to, to uh, Depew Synthes Spine. Uh, they have a virtual presence at all society meetings that you might be attending. Um, and they also have short webinars on transitioning, case reviews, billing, coding, et cetera, uh, and uh, live cadaveric demo demonstrations. Uh, and a, 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 a fellows roundtable. And so uh, 
if you uh, I get an in, uh, invitation from one of these folks, uh, please pay attention. And uh, it's usually great educational content uh, that will help you not just in your fellowship year, but in your practice and beyond. In terms of fellowship directors, we are going to uh, have new applications for the 2021 and 23 fellowship program. Uh, this is going to be a new electronic format and the fellowship committee will go through that, uh, evaluate the um, uh, merits of each individual fellowship. Uh, there are limited number of fellowships are available and uh, we'll be sending out those details uh, come October. With that, I, I want to shift gears a little bit. And so I guess I, I want to say welcome to all of you and uh, I'm happy that you're able to be here uh, online and uh, starting to think about uh, the fellowship year but I want you to make the most out of this year. And so I've invited again two of my former fellows, Rich Hurley, uh, who joined the Army in 2008 uh, after uh, uh, medical school at UT uh, Science Cell in uh, uh, San Antonio. He did his residency at Brooke uh, and then came to his fellowship uh, here at UC Davis. Uh, he spent some time uh, overseas in the desert and has come back and has a very busy practice. Uh, at Brook Army Medical Center. He's going to talk to us about how to make the most out of that one year of fellowship. And then uh, Anath Eliswarapu, uh, Anath uh, graduated from University of Chicago uh, and then uh, did residency there and then came in to the, uh, UC Davis. I mean, he's now an orthopedic spine surgeon at uh, Montefiore uh, Medical Center in New York City. And he's going to focus on what do you do next? So as you approach the tail end of your fellowship, how do you think about practice? How do you learn the things you need to do during your fellowship? And then uh, how do you successfully transition to be uh, a surgeon uh, of caliber? So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the sharing. Hopefully I've done that successfully. And then uh, Rich, I'm gonna get you to share your screen. We'll see if we can't. Let's make this look good. And then, uh, and then I do want this to be, that was uh, uh, fairly boring just listening to me talk. And so hopefully you guys are still awake. Um, but Rich, I want this to be interactive. We're gonna have some fun with this, okay? And so if you put me to sleep, I'll start peppering you with questions. All right, I love it. <laughs> All right, can you see my slides? And, yeah, I, we can see your slides and you look good, by the way. Is that, <laughs> is that what color is that, is that shirt? It's red looks red. Okay, very good. Uh, well, let me first start by saying congratulations. Um, I remember being in your shoes and how excited I was. Uh, so excited, in fact, that the day before my first case, I called Kleinberg to go over the details of that case kind of in a panicked fashion. So anyway, I remember that that night. I, I think I actually cut my hand making dinner that night and I was injured for the first case at fellowship year. So that's good. <clears throat> All right, so you, you are about to embark in a fellowship, and so I'm going to talk about how to make uh, that year uh, the best year possible. So I kind of think about fellowship uh, as a buffet analogy. So there are many surgical options that you're going to see um, throughout the year, um, and that's good. You, know, you want to get a, a lot of exposure to a lot of different options. So you, what you want to do is you want to kind of take note of what works and maybe more importantly, maybe what, what doesn't work or what could it be improved upon so that you can you know, uh, hone your skills as the year goes on. And with all those options that are given, you wanna uh, take what maybe seems most efficacious for uh, that specific pathology. Uh, so if you're dealing with the degen spondy, you know, do, you, do you need to address the neuroframal stenosis or whatever the case may be, and how do you do that? And what's the most efficacious way? Uh, and then the other thing I encourage you to do, and I hope you can see the pictures here, is maybe take some photos, um, you know, in a HIPAA compliant manner, obviously, uh, but take some pictures of complex setups, because you'll be surprised when you go to your next hospital, um, you know, that some of this stuff is not uh, maybe standard of, of how they do things. And so, you know, you want to look good, you want your team to look good, you want to give your patients the best possible outcome. And, and so you want to reproduce this. And so this is a good way to do that. Um, Pre-op planning, I think, is also super important, um, and you're going to uh, hear, uh, well, there's a phrase that I, I use uh, with my residents that's plan your operation and then operate your plan. You probably all heard that uh, in your residency programs, but it, it's very important, and so I'll, I'll do a lot of homework when I go into a case uh, to be really prepared for whatever I, may, I might see. I'll list out the steps preoperatively, 
and then I'll talk to you know my attendings uh, even after the case to find out what mattered most uh, in their mind during that procedure. And the other thing I would say is also template your cases. So get uh, comfortable using you know whether it's impacts uh, or uh, you know what I'm not going to name uh, specific software companies, but learn how to make uh, cuts, learn how to plan your, your surgeries and, and then try and uh, take those as PowerPoints into the operating room so that you can you know, kind of go level by level as you operate. And then I also would save these kind of as a guide once you uh, got out of fellowship, you know, so that uh, you know, I could use these to template uh, my procedures um, you know, when I got in, 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 in practice. Um, and then also, I would also encourage you to get copies of your attendings' preference cards for your cases because there are specific things on their cards that you will take for granted that you don't you don't want to miss out on when you leave. Uh, this actually uh, was an idea that was passed on to me, so I can't take full credit for this. Uh, you'll hear from him next, but Anak gave me this spreadsheet, or at least a template uh, templated spreadsheet before I took over at UC Davis. And this was super helpful to me. So I would log the diagnosis, the levels, the, the patient's age, the setting, uh, the, the region of the spine with the specific pathology we were treating, the attending I operated with. And, and I would, and it, you can see from uh, this spreadsheet that I would even create hyperlinks from this spreadsheet and they would open up those PowerPoints for those cases that I would uh, do as a, as a fellow. So this has, uh, you know, a lot of benefit in the sense that you kind of, you, you can log, you know, like how many of your cases have been adult versus PEDS. You can see how much DGEN you work versus revision. So you get to identify your deficiencies at the end of the year, which is really nice. And then the other thing I would say is uh, you can go back also and log your complications. Um, and that may seem kind of silly while you're doing it, but the benefit is when you leave, you know, you've got, you know, you've got these cases that you can go back to and look and see what you did uh, that really helped uh, that patient uh, deal with that specific uh, post-operative uh, complication. I felt like this, this helped me in my, uh, as I transitioned uh, out. Um, ca case presentations. So if you get in the habit of uh, creating PowerPoints for cases, then this kind of falls in, in, in next. You know, you, you want to create uh, a folder with case examples uh, as you go along through the year. Um, this will help you if you, you know, let's say you transition off the DGEN service, you go to trauma, and then maybe you come back and you do a couple other cases, you can go back and you can look at that setup and you, you'll have a fresh reminder on your mind. Uh, but then, you know, if you're treating a complex problem, and let's say hypothetically you want to show an example to, a, you know, a patient, uh, most of the PowerPoints that I would make would be like de-identified PowerPoints. And so I could open one of those and say, you know, here's an example of this path pathology. Here's an example of how we treated that. And you can use that uh, to your advantage uh, to help educate your patients and even, you know, uh, as an opportunity to educate residents, you know, if you have uh, residents that are going to be participating in the, in the cases. Um, I would create an interesting x-rays folder. Um, I find that this is also something that's super useful. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there are times when you come across a rare pathology. Um, and I think what this does is this, this at least in, in, my mind, this is a nice segue for an educational opportunity. So, uh, you know, you can you can create this folder as you go, and then when you and your attending have an opportunity to talk, you know, during your lunch break at clinic or whatnot, this can this can help lead a, a conversation and help you know help you. Uh, or it could also be, like I said, another educational opportunity for for you and the residents. Um, research, I think, is something that uh, fortunately, I, you know, I went to went to a place, and you, you, many of you will as well, where research is a, a big a big part of the fellowship program. So come up with the topic early. Um, you want to get with your attendings because they already have ideas, by the way, and they will absolutely uh, help guide you in this process. Um, and so you want to you want to utilize those great ideas that they have. You want to utilize uh, the resources that they may have uh, and take advantage of the fact that you're working with, you know, folks who can help mentor you, meet the research team, get to work on a protocol, get IRB approval, ASAP, and then, you know, the near, year's going to sneak up on you. So uh, I, th I think Dr. Kleinberg highlighted that your, your, your abstracts, I think, are going to be on the 31st of January. You'll be surprised at how quickly that, that does uh, come around. And so um, just try and be ready for that if you can. And then um, something else that I uh, took away from fellowship, um, and this also helped me during the year to make me more efficient. So you know, your time is very valuable as a fellow and you want to be as efficient as possible. But a lot of places will have existing note templates, whether it be for clinic or surgery or whatnot. Um, take advantage of those and ultimately try and own those templates and make them your own and then customize those so that when you leave, 
you have something that you can take with you that you can reference. Uh, this is this is, uh, but it also helps you know your whole team, right? So as a fellow, if you're if you're in the in the process of you know uh, making these notes uh, work better and be uh, you know more detailed, I think that that ultimately helps your team, helps communicate to your you know other fellows, co-fellows, uh, attendings what what was done. Anyway, just a just an important thing. Uh, round and seat clinic. So you will learn so much in the operating room this year, but you also learn equally uh, important things on rounds and then also in clinic. And so, uh, you know, I encourage you, each of you uh, to, to round because you will see postoperative complications and those are good. Uh, as a fellow, you want to see postoperative uh, complications, not, be, you know, you do and you don't, right? So, but you want to know what the what the right way to treat those are, and you want to know um, what you can do or what you can take away from fellowship to help you. Obviously, seeing seeing clinic is equally important. You know, you get to see unique things in clinic, and uh, you know, radiographic ways to work things, you know, things up. And um, I took a lot of a, a lot of uh, a lot of what I learned about uh, treating specific pathology from uh, conversations that we would have in in uh, clinical settings. Um, and so I think that it's super important to do that. And then many of you will be asked to speak at Grand Rounds. So pick a topic that you're either passionate about or maybe pick one that you know you have a limitation on. Uh, and then take that as an opportunity to educate yourself uh, and then start prep, uh, preparing for that talk uh, uh, very early on. And then finally, I would just say, you know, we all, uh, you know, do residency, then we go to fellowship, right? And uh, fellowship is an opportunity to either remain humble or be humble. And so, uh, you know, make, if you make a mistake, recognize it, own it, and make yourself better. If you, um, if you can volunteer to lead M&Ms, I think this is a great way to get kind of comfortable in an uncomfortable setting. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of things that you can take away. Uh, from fellowship, and you're going to see, you know, maybe maybe they treat pathology differently at your fellowship program than they did in your residency, and that's okay. You want to see that. You want to you want to really take advantage of that. So I just encourage each of you to you know remain humble throughout the year. So that's about it. That's good, Hurley. Good stuff. Jeez, you can take a breath now. Uh, the, All right, can I talk the, to you? No, it was good. It was good. I mean, it, there's like so many uh, great uh, pearls in there. Um, I, I want to encourage any of the fellows to please ask any questions you have in the Q&A for Rich and Anath or myself uh, during this process. Again, we want to keep it interactive. Hey, uh, so I, I, Rich, I got a question for you and Anath. Anything, you, and, and both of you guys w did all of these things. You, you uh, started research projects early, which I think is always a challenge because, um, you know, it's, you feel like you've got tons of time in the world and all of a sudden it all gets used up. You guys kept a case log, which I think was also critically important, and kept track of the those cases. Anything, anything you didn't do that you wish you had done? They wish you could go back. Um, I don't know, Nath. You have a, you have an answer for that? Yeah, I wish I had kind of um, you know you're always assigned to work with an attending on a particular day. I wish I had kind of looked at what other attendings were doing and just kind of. Um, if there's something like I hadn't seen before, or interesting, been more like uh, aggressive, I guess, or entrepreneurial about trying to find those opportunities. Cause especially early in the fellowship, if someone's doing like a rare case, you always think it's gonna come up again, but you never know, things come in bunches. So I would take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, I think that's a good call. You know, the, the have, make sure that there's some flexibility. The best is to have a little bit of flexibility in your residency and fellowship. Uh, so that you can switch off with fellows time to time to, and switch off with other residents. Uh, I think that there's always this idea of like double scrubbing, scrubbing with my other fellow. Sometimes those are the best cases when it's you and the other fellow uh, or you and a senior resident together and you can kind of uh, muscle the, uh, the attending out of the way. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, I love that idea. Um, there was a question about for Dr. Hurley, is there a way to see a sample prep case You've created what system did you use a template and um, uh, did you do anything that was ready, readily accessible? It looked like you used Surgimap for your um, for your templating. Is that right? That's correct. I use Surgimap for my templating my cases. Surgimap obviously has changed a little bit. Uh, you know, the the software has uh, gone through some revisions, uh, but yes, I use Surgimap uh, and basically I would just take the pre-op images, make my, uh, you know, uh, cuts or whatever on, on surgeon map, save it all to a PowerPoint and the OR, you know, I try to go level by level. Um, you know, so if I was doing a, you know, a deformity procedure or something, 
pelvis or whatever, I would measure out my pedicle screws at 10 and create a slide for that 11, slide for that 12, slide for that. And then, you know, ultimately the beginning and end were, you know, pre and post-op, you know, goal. Yeah, I wish I not did that. Ah. I might start. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> The, the one thing I tell you for sure is that doing that templating ahead of time sh makes the surgery itself the day of a lot more relaxing. Um, and I do, it's all, you know, some, it just, you, you need to do what your attending likes to do. Obviously that's part of it, but um, it's certainly in the beginning of the year, I, I like everyone to measure those things in surgery map to think about their correction that they're going to get. Um, and Nathan Richard can, can uh, attest to that. Um, and then I also like you to measure at least the lengths of your pedicle screws. And what's nice about that is when you're in the operating room and you're feeling, you say, geez, it feels short like a 35. You, if you've measured and you know it's a 55 ahead of time, then you know that uh, either your trajectory is wrong or your angle is wrong or that there's a, uh, some sort of cortical uh, bridge or something in there uh, that can make a difference. Um, and so that can help you just, just kind of be relaxed in the operating room, particularly since uh, you're training uh, to do this all on your own. Yep. Anything else? Did you guys have any specific books that you guys read during your fellowship year that you would say are an absolute must? Um, was there some other educational, you know, one of the things that, that I struggle with this year so much with our fellows is with coronavirus. Um, these poor guys don't get to go to courses as much. And so a lot of the content is going to be online or is going to be via um, uh, via books that they read. Is there, is there a book that you guys thought was particularly good or useful? I mean, I used the Rothman Simeon uh, spine. I actually, someone gave it to me in residency as a gift, and I thought it was pretty good. Um, but there's not, not always a lot of time to read textbooks and fellowships. I would use like journal articles and review papers and stuff a lot too. Yeah, and I, I think that fellowship reading list is great. The OKU book is great. Um, just so those general knowledge books, are, again, it's, it's amazing. All the things that you think you know that you might not know. Um, and then uh, it, you got to learn to enjoy the pimp, right? And so the questions that you get asked and, um, and also to use that knowledge to pimp the other residents who are with you. I think that, right, it is truly a new one, you know, a see one, do one, teach one. The teach one, you learn as much as you did the first couple go rounds. That's right. I was going to say there's one more textbook. Um, it's another double AOS publication, but um, it's uh, Advanced Spine Care 2. Uh, that's a really good book. Uh, it, it's full of pictures because I can't read, so that's beautiful for me. That's good. It all is it crayons and finger painting? But it's really good. It's a, it's a very good publication. Yeah, I think that's a good. I think uh, those are great suggestions. All right, um, let's let's go ahead and move on to the next session. So, uh, Anath, if, uh, Rich will probably have to stop sharing, and then Anath, you'll you'll share your screen. So let's let's talk about well, what happens next. Great, you 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 were able to. Um, get your operative list. You were able to keep track, particularly of those um, uh, those special cases, but maybe also keeping track of those simple cases. Um, I think writing down and doing the dictation to figure out the little steps, I think is uh, uh, a great suggestion idea. And then um, I, for all of my fellows, I think uh, each, each fellow has asked me whether or not I should or shouldn't do a surgery, but never asked me how to do it. And so you're gonna see how to do it a bunch. Um, and the questions always arise in clinic and on uh, what makes the most sense and what do I do now that I've had this uh, esoteric complication and, and uh, where to go from there. Not that you're able to share. Are you, are you guys able to see my slides? No. Oh, let me try again. Okay, can you see the slides now? Yeah, looks okay, great. Good. All right, good. So uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to give this talk. Um, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon, Montefiore Medical Center in New York City, and I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about transitioning from training into practice. So uh, just like everyone else, I've been stuck at home watching a lot of movies and TV. So I tried to think about what wisdom I could find from some classic movies to impart to you guys tonight. So. This is office space. This is where the guy is in his therapist's office. And he says, ever since I started working, every day has been worse than the day before. That means every time you see me, it's on the worst day of my life. So hopefully if you pay close attention tonight, uh, you can avoid having this talk with your therapist in a few years. So here's some uh, things I wanna to cover tonight. Finding a job first and foremost, 
what to do during your fellowship to get ready for your job, what to do uh, when you first start your practice to start off on the right foot, and then some quick tips for life outside the hospital. So these are some factors I think you should consider for your first job. Um, location, obviously. I think volume is very important when you're first starting out. It's kind of how you get over the hump experience-wise and put, put your name out there in the community. It's also really important to have enough cases to take the boards and to earn things like block time. And I think you, you would think that uh, practice wouldn't hire you unless they had a lot of volume available for you, but there's all kinds of reasons why they might. So, um, you know, they may just want someone to help cover call, things like that. So you gotta make sure that they really have the volume in place before you start. Um, I think senior partners is very important. You're gonna end up being a lot like the senior partners in your practice, you'll evolve in that direction. So pick people that you wanna be like. And I think you have to be honest with yourself. So if you're a very um, conservative surgeon, you may wanna join a practice that matches that or vice versa. If you wanna be very high volume, you wanna make sure you're at a practice that can support that. Um, if you have niche interests, things like tumor deformity, you have to make sure you're joining a practice where the infrastructure is in place to support that. And you also wanna make sure that you're not joining a place that has like a, a quote unquote tumor guy that's gonna be upset if you start taking some of those cases. So you wanna make sure, if you do have an interest in something like this, you wanna make sure it's gonna be possible with the practice that you join. Uh, board certification is very important uh, part of the process. You wanna make sure that you're at a place that will help you in terms of being able to attain board certification. So if they're asking you to see 100 patients a day or if all the notes are computer generated, that may not be uh, very helpful uh, for the board. So you wanna make sure it's a place that will support you in that process. And I put money last. I think that's actually, um, in the beginning, it's not the most important thing. Um, I think if you can get some of these other things right and get off to a good foot, there's always gonna be opportunities later on to try to make money, but I, I wouldn't focus on that. So I would not say this uh, when you go in for your interviews for your first job. So how to find a job? I think word of mouth is a really good um, way to do it. A lot of the best jobs never get advertised. Obviously, if you get a recommendation for a, for a job from an implant rep, I would uh, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, any smart implant rep will never say anything bad about any practice, so make sure you do your own research. Um, cold emailing can be um, a very good technique. Um, the yield is low. You might have to send out like 100 emails to get two replies, but maybe one of those two could be a really good opportunity for you. So I think it's still worth doing. Um, you can use the different society websites. I think those are really good resources. And uh, the last thing I'll just say is this, be very careful with recruiters. Um, obviously they are getting a commission for um, referring you and they don't really care how good the job is or how long you stay there. So I would definitely do your own research uh, for any job that you get referred to by a recruiter. Uh, the last, enough. Yeah. I'm sorry if I can, when, when should people start thinking about this? When should they start looking at word of mouth or doing the cold emailing? And uh, is, that, is that something they should start on day one? Should they start halfway through? When do you think is appropriate? Now let's start right now. I think um, it's never too early. Uh, even if a practice is not hiring right now, um, if you kind of express interest and then they have an opening unexpectedly open up, I think it's always good to have a, a pattern of being interested. Um, so I would just start right now. Um, in terms of what you can do, like your last few months of fellowship to get ready for your practice, uh, I would try to fill uh, the remaining holes in your experience, like we discussed earlier. So if there are things that you haven't seen, um, kind of rare cases, I try to look for opportunities. And I think you can even think outside the box. So. You know, if at your fellowship, you don't do a lot of minimally invasive, but there's someone in your community that does, you can kind of just contact them and see if you could spend a couple of days watching them operate. And I think most people would be open to that. Um, I think it's a good idea, like um, Dr. Hurley was saying, take pictures, take video, even of a case. It's really useful to have that kind of reference um, for yourself once you get into practice, because you will kind of have a gap before you start getting busy in your practice. And you may forget some things. So it's nice to have that reference. Um, you should figure out which instruments your attendings use that you want to take with you. So oftentimes the instruments are given uh, nicknames that are unique to the particular hospital. So you want to figure out what they're really called so you can ask for them. I put a picture of this curved freer here in honor of Dr. Kleinberg, because uh, that's his weapon of choice in the OR. And I haven't actually, I don't have one in my uh, set. So I've kind of adapted to using a Woodson or Penfield 4, but I do kind of miss it sometimes. So 
if you have anything you really like from fellowship, you should definitely try to ask for it. And then I um, love that. I love that curve freer. <laughs> I know. I, I'm surprised. I went to your house. I'm surprised you weren't eating like your Cheerios with it. I know. I, I know. do. I do. I just wouldn't <laughs> let you eat with them. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, that brings me to my next point. You got to ask to do the attending parts of the case. So every attending has like certain parts of the case that they're um, very protective of. Um, so towards the end of your fellowship, I think it's fair game to ask. Like if you haven't walked around and put screws in from the left side, I think it's a good idea. And that way you kind of, if there's something that you get stuck on, there's um, still supervision to get you unstuck at that point. So this is what you got to tell your attending, just like Tyler Durden said, stop trying to control everything and just let go. So for your first months in practice, um, I would try to keep a positive attitude. So you're kind of um, at the bottom of the totem pole and they're going to make you, you know, cover clinics that other people don't want to cover or, you know, take call, maybe in a call pool other people don't want to do. You're always going to have like certain new guy things that um, you have to deal with, but just to keep a positive attitude. If you just um, show up and try to make the most of it, I think things will get better. And oftentimes some of those things that other people don't want to do can actually be an opportunity for you as being new in the practice. So I would just uh, be as positive as possible. Uh, you should be diplomatic. So uh, people are getting to know you a little bit. Um, so there's different situations that can come up. For example, if a patient comes to you for a second opinion and you agree with what the other surgeon is doing, I wouldn't try to steal the case. I would just say something like, you know, I agree with what they're doing. You're in very good hands. Or if you don't agree with what they're doing, I wouldn't say like that's the wrong thing to do. Um, just be like graceful about how you say stuff when you see patients. If someone, if a patient has a complication somewhere else and then comes to see you, uh, just think about how you would want to be treated if you had a complication and the patient went to see someone else. Just be kind of nice, be graceful because the people in your community, ultimately, I mean, they're the ones who are going to be, you know, on the block com committee at your hospital or reviewing your cases. So in addition to just being like kind of the right thing to do, I think it's important to um, be friends with everybody when you're starting out. Um, you should go to conference. So if you have like an orthopedic grand rounds at your hospital, I think it's a good idea to go to it. Um, you can meet people from other groups and they may not have a spine surgeon in their group. So it could be a good source of referrals. Um, you may um, be on call sometime and you need help from like a joint surgeon or trauma surgeon. So I think it's, it's very valuable for people to see you around and for you to know the other surgeons at your hospital. Um, you should come up with a good answer to the how many times have you done this question. So I think this is from Airplane. The lady says, are you nervous? The guy says, yeah. Is this your first time? And he says, no, I've been nervous many times. So this is not a good approach, but uh, hopefully you can think of something uh, better than this to say when you have uh, patients ask you how often you've done something. Uh, I put in a special, go ahead. And I'm just going to step in real quick. Just, um, you know, I, th I think the, the, it's a great point on the referrals and the second opinions. Um, you should try very hard. If someone sees you for a second opinion, your first answer should be how to get that person back to whomever sent it to you. Um, it's uh, you never want to be the surgeon who's stealing cases. Uh, that's a terrible reputation to get into. It's bad for you. It's bad for the patient. It's certainly bad for um, the physician to send them to you. So, uh, make there's there's uh, just be very very cautious with that, um, and then I like that. So what what did you guys, Rich? Uh, what, what did you not say when they asked you, "Hey, listen, how many times have you done this?" I, I just tell them the truth. Yeah. Uh, so say yeah. this is my first time or second time doing this, and I've been. Or I think it's also fair game to if you've done that procedure multiple times during fellowship and multiple times during residency, it's okay to to think of that as your cumulative experience because uh, you are truly relying on that cumulative experience um, and, and I think it's appropriate to say hey listen this first hand, first time I've done this at this institution uh, but I've taken you know I've been had six years of training and um, and everybody on this phone call is incredibly well trained and well versed and uh, you should you should not feel intimidated or shy about uh, about uh, uh, beating your chest a little bit and, and talking about how much experience and exposure you've had. Not, I, were, any other perils? No, that's what I would tell patients. I would say, you know, I'm new here, but this is a case that I've done quite a few times in my training. And um, yeah, I think you're in good hands with me. So. Very good. I, th I, think that's a, I think that's important. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no problem. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about managing complications, since I think that's actually probably the most challenging part of your first couple of years in practice. 
So I think the complication management begins before the surgery. So it's very important to talk to the patient. If you are doing a case, um, you wanna think about what complications are likely to happen and then try to educate the patient about them before they happen. So if I'm doing like a revision where I'm taking scar off the dura, I'll spend some time like talking about the possibility of a dural tear, CSF leak, uh, things like that. So that if it does happen, then it's not the first time you're having that conversation and the patient's more likely to trust you because then you can say, oh, this is something we anticipated, we were prepared for it, we've seen it before, and this is what we're gonna do to fix it. And it's a lot better than the patient feeling like something happened that you didn't expect. Um, what's a dural tear? What's that? What is a dural tear? Is that when you make, I've, never, I've, I've read about that, but I don't think I've ever seen that. I think they've seen you, Dr. Kleinberg. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> so part of, the, part, part of the reason I had such a hard time managing complications when I started out is I just didn't see enough of them uh, working with Dr. Kleinberg. So um, you should, uh, when you have a complication, you should be honest, um, but you don't have to get into the gory details. I don't think it's like necessary for you to, you're going to feel very guilty, but you got to kind of process that guilt internally. Um, and I think you just got to, when you talk to the patient, just tell them, this is what happened. This is what we need to do. This is the plan. I don't think you want to um, belabor the point too much, but definitely you need to be honest and tell them that a complication has happened. Um, you should ask for help early. I think you can even uh, call someone from the operating room. Um, that's not a problem. You can call your mentor or one of your co-surgeons, but it's always good to get someone involved who um, is not emotionally entangled with having caused the complication so they can think with a cool head. And then, you know, if you're going to eventually show this at m and or something, it's always good to have another surgeon who can say they were there, especially if it's someone with established um, credentials at the hospital, kind of credibility. It's, it's very helpful as a young surgeon to have someone else on board if there is a complication. And then I think that um, it makes sense to give the patient your cell phone number and just round on them personally, uh, at least once a day, just be around a lot. And you can um, you know, talk to their family if they want, but it really helps a lot if you're just kind of ever present uh, in, with the patient when you have a complication that helps them you know, the worst thing would be if they felt like you weren't listening to them or you weren't, you didn't care or something. So you just want to be around a lot when a complication happens. Um, so hopefully you can say complications arose, ensued, and were overcome. And finally, just a few tips on life outside the hospital. So don't pick up any new bad habits. So if you've like never done drugs before, I think at this point you've kind of missed the boat on that. So Definitely don't start now. Um, it seems like people, when they get into practice, they have money for the first time. Sometimes they can get into bad situations. Um, you should finish your documentation if you can before going home, especially if you have kids. I think it's nice to just go home and not be taking your work home with you if possible. Um, you should keep in touch with your friends. I think if you talk to your friends that are in medicine, that's really helpful to share experiences, but also your friends like outside of medicine because then all the drama and politics of your job will kind of be put into perspective when you talk to them. Um, you should take care of yourself mentally and physically. I think spine surgery is like a physical job. Like you're on your feet, you have to make decisions. So you don't want to be sleep deprived or hungry and allow that to affect your decision making. And finally, I think you should let family time be family time. So especially if you have kids, I think when you're at home and you're with your kids, you really um, should try to focus on being with them, being present. So this is my one-year-old daughter, uh, Naya. And when I fell at home and I scraped my knee, she insisted on doing dressing changes on me. So that's when I thought maybe I'm talking about work too much at home and I gotta stop that. So this is what Dr. Kleinberg told me, um, I think my first week of fellowship. He said, focus on taking care of your family first, then make sure your patients are taken care of, everything else comes third. So for me, that really provided a lot of clarity. Um, and I think that's uh, good advice for you guys to take forward through your fellowship and when you start your practice. And I wish you all the greatest of success. I put my email address on here. So if you guys have any questions about finding a job or um, you know, marketing yourself, starting your practice, please feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, great, uh, so good group of talks in terms of uh, ideas about what to do this year that, that can prepare you for the years to come. So uh, well, there's a couple questions in the Q&A section. So one was, uh, Rich, can you name the, repeat the name of the book you mentioned? Yes, it's Advanced Spine Care. It's a double AOS uh, publication. Uh, you can Advanced Spine Care, perfect. Yeah. Good. 
Um, there was a question about how I like to use use the curve for a knock is right. I use it everywhere. So I use it for uh, dissection, feeling the foramen, uh, eating my Cheerios and, uh, and everything in between. Um, and then Anath and Rich, any advice when you went to your new jobs and, and you said, listen, um, you need some simple stuff like a simple curette and that's pretty straightforward for them to get for you. Did you ask for that stuff immediately upon taking the job? Do you ask for that after you get there? How did you, is there any strategy? And then again, what if you need something really expensive like, uh, um, uh, like a robot or an O-arm uh, and you, they don't have that at your institution or is there any strategy for that? And I wouldn't ask you take that for a lot of stuff like um, when, when you first start because you're not busy yet. You're kind of not a, you're a cost center for the hospital when you first start. So I wouldn't go in immediately asking for a lot of really expensive stuff. Um, but if it's something small, I mean, sometimes the implant reps or the OR staff will know like an equivalent at your hospital. It may not be exactly what you're used to. Um, so I try to like make the most of what you have. Like when I started, uh, I just started a new job here at Montefiore and they, one of my co-surgeons was like, um, in the beginning, you're going to have to operate with your shoe sometimes. So you just got to be a little flexible when you start. Um, I wouldn't ask for like a lot of stuff in general, like kind of make do with what you have in the beginning. And then as you get busier, you can start to ask for more things, I think. Rich, what do you think? When I got to my hospital, you know, obviously there, it's a level one trauma center. So there's a lot of that capital equipment was already purchased. But um, you know, some things that I had missed, like for instance, a curve freer. Um, I went down to SPD and they had kind of a, a graveyard in SPD of like instruments. And I literally dug, and it was a huge room. So I literally dug through and found lots of instruments like a curve freer and you know, a sucker tip retractor and just a lot of things. And then I created my own little special set and I put those things in my set. And so it's on my preference card now. And so anytime I need something like that, they just put my set. Yeah, I think uh, so. I think both of those are, are great advice. The one, the one thing I would say is uh, don't under, underestimate um, your surgical reps in this realm. So they can be very helpful at getting you specific instruments that you feel like you need. Um, so I would engage them. Again, there is the, there is the Depew Synthes um, uh, 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 outreach team. And I, I would talk to them about, hey, listen, I'm going to wherever, uh, New York or, uh, or Texas, and this, these are the Im instruments I need. Uh, let's see what you can do to get them there. Um, they're usually very helpful making it, making those things. For the large capital equipment purchases, the, the half a million dollar robot or a half a million dollar O-arm, um, I think you, you will need to really think about how critical that is for you to have at your practice. If the answer is that you can't do the surgery without having it there, um, then make sure you have it, but ask for that up front. Uh, because if you can't do surgery when you get to their hospital because you need a, a robot or an O-arm, uh, that's going to be a tough road to hoe. And so make sure you do have that stuff ahead of time if that's necessary. Um, I also wanted to ask you guys a little bit about uh, what has life been like as a practicing surgeon uh, with uh, uh, the coronavirus and COVID? And kind of uh, get your perspective on, on how that's gone for you um, things that you've worked to, to get through it and uh, things that you'd recommend for uh, all the all the resident, all the fellows I'm sure on the call are nervous about this idea about how do I get a job during coronavirus? Um, they can barely get a, right, we can barely get on the, on a website. Um, any, any tips, any thoughts, any ideas? I think it's, um, it is challenging um, with the coronavirus, but I think, like I said, I think starting early is um, definitely to your advantage. I would uh, apply widely. Um, so even if places aren't advertising, I would just reach out to them because things may get better and maybe they'll be like hiring later in the year. And then I'd also, I think uh, something you used to say was just your first job is your first job. So I think you should just be flexible, um, take the best opportunity available and do your best. And if you build a good reputation, I think you may be able to transition to something else later, even if it's not a perfect situation in the beginning. And then what is, what's your practice been like with coronavirus in New York? Are things back to normal? Are they still slow down? Um, do there's, there's just some to be, seem to be a big backlog. I know a lot of the fellows were nervous about how many cases they're going to see and what they're going to be able to do. How do things feel to you right now? At this point, it's, um, it's pretty busy. So we're doing a lot of inpatient clinic visits. And certainly there's a lot of, a lot of patients who've been waiting. Um, so there's a lot of pathology that's available. So at this point, um, assuming no second wave, hopefully things are quite busy right now. 
Good, great. Rich, any thoughts from you about the same, those two same questions? Sure. So uh, I've been able to utilize uh, virtual health appointments to do some checks. Um, I'll have patients come in, you know, get x-rays, get MRI, and then do virtual health appointments with them uh, and kind of build like a list. Uh, so I've kept a spreadsheet of patients that I've talked to and, and like you know, some of my highlight for potential operative appointments. Uh, you know, when the length of things open up. Um, and then the other thing I've done is I, I've taken this opportunity to go and introduce myself to like primary care physicians and like neurology and uh, PMR and uh, pain management. So I've had a chance to go around and meet a lot of folks, take my card, uh, give them my email address, give my personal cell phone, and uh, respond to their email within 24 hours. Uh, great. And then what's, what's your like, life like? What happened with coronavirus? Uh, you had a weird, you had a weird situation where you were in Afghanistan for a while and uh, and working over there, and then popped over right right in the middle of uh, coronavirus. Uh, how are things looking for you in terms of your practice? And so, um, you know, if I was I guess fortunate in the sense that I'm at a level one trauma center and I'm in the spine uh, call pool, so I've had that as a, a as a, a you know ability to do cases. Uh, I've also taken some general orthopedic, you know call so that I can continue to do some uh, additional cases because I'm in board collection right now. Uh, and then, you know, from a military standpoint, uh, yeah, I mean, we've been a little slower to, to bring on elective uh, surgeries at our location, uh, but that's because uh, we are like the designated trauma center uh, and the other hospital in town, the other major medical center is the designated COVID hospital. So we, we've been getting a lot of trauma. Yeah, good. And then just just for for I'll answer the same kind of question. So you know, in terms of uh, of uh, I think there I appreciate the anxiety. Everyone's nervous about getting a job as a fellow. Um, uh, all your attendings and uh, myself and everyone included is nervous about their first job, and that's good. That's normal. Um, I agree. You want to apply early. Um, I would I would tell you to enjoy the year. This is a great year. You never get it back. Um, you get to operate with someone else's credit card. Uh, you get to make mistakes and go home and sleep pretty good. Uh, the, that, that goes away pretty quickly when they're your mistakes and they're all on you. And so enjoy that process. Um, I would take the year seriously because um, there are some great things that you can get out of it. Um, uh, you should push yourself to, to uh, get to all those cases and, um, and really enjoy um, what you need to do and how you're going to do it. Um, and uh, uh, I think you can all, I think you're going to, you're going to have a great and wonderful career and, and enjoy the process. Don't get so excited to get to the next step of practice that you miss out on the fun in front of you. Um, and the, the learning really is a, a great time. Um, I, the, the other thing is in terms of coronavirus, you know, here at UC Davis, we're in California, we did have a second wave where that we slowed down again. Uh, after March, but we were essentially back up to speed. And I think that's the general consensus around the country is that uh, we're essentially moving forward full steam ahead um, uh, for both uh, trauma cases and elective cases. And uh, I think uh, we, like the rest of you, are a little anxious about how things are going to happen. I think uh, there was a question about, uh, discuss a little bit more about the Banff Fellows Forum. And um, the last year, unfortunately, both of you guys were able to participate at Banff. Um, and uh, went to, to Canada. Um, any, uh, uh, we only have a few minutes, but any thoughts about that experience and being there as a, as a fellow with your mentors? That was a cool experience. I mean, hopefully it'll be possible for this year's group of fellows, but the important thing is just hearing like what people have to say, all the advice talks and case reviews. So even if it's virtual, it's still gonna be a very good experience. Yeah. Yeah, and the one thing that we did when, when I was at Banff is uh, we, we created a, a, a list of emails for a lot of the folks that you know, I, I met at the meeting. And now when we have complicated cases that come up, we send them out and we say, hey, you know, what did you do with this? Yeah, I think that, that that's part of this online thing that is, that is the hardest, uh, is uh, maintaining and enjoying that network of people. Um, it's one of the things that the AO is, you know, we talk about why, why do you stay, you know, why do I stay part of the AO? And that's my favorite bit of it is that um, all these participants on the phone call here and all these fellowship directors from different locations and around the world are some of my best friends. Um, and I hope, uh, and I know that you guys are experienced that as well. Um, it may be a little slow and it may be kind of weird in this beginning, but um, take advantage of that. 
Uh, I think that you're going to see throughout the year that uh, these virtual meetings can be accessible. They can be enjoyable. They can um, uh, be engaging. You just have to, you have, do have to, to put some of the work into it uh, to make it engaging and interesting. Um, the case presentations, I think, are, are times where you really are going to, uh, where I think this online forum can also be very, very successful. I will tell you that the BAMP online sessions that we had this year were, were quite good and enjoyable. Uh, people were able to present their research and have thoughtful discussions. And uh, I thought all, all, of all, all, of all, all in all, it was quite successful. Um, we got a couple of minutes left. The last couple of questions were, is there a deadline by which we should have a job locked down? Um, and how long does it take for contract to contract signing? Um, and off any thoughts on that? So I don't think there's a deadline. Um, I think I would take my time and really evaluate a uh, position before you accept it. In terms of the contract, it really depends if you're joining a, a private practice or an academic facility. So if you're joining like a hospital system, usually there's not a lot of room for negotiation. It's pretty boilerplate, but if it's a private practice, then yeah, I think it's worthwhile having it reviewed by an attorney. And uh, it usually doesn't take too long. It's pretty, pretty standard. But you're in the military, so they probably just handed you your papers and told you to get to work, huh? <laughs> Exactly right. <laughs> Good. That's see. It sounds like UC Davis actually. <laughs> um, and then there were some questions about social media profile as a young surgeon. Um, you know, a couple. I do have a little some advice about that. So first of all, I would tell you you should uh, joining LinkedIn is a great idea. Um, your patients will look for you online. Be cautious. Um, and so I, I'm sure that you are all more well behaved than I uh, ever was. Uh, or am, uh, but be cautious. So I think if you have an Instagram profile and your patients can find you, they will see everything that you do on Instagram. And so just uh, just be thoughtful about that. Um, I think a LinkedIn and a professional uh, website and uh, development is important uh, because your patients will search for you and think about you, um, but just, uh, just be very careful about how that all works. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have reached the witching hour it is now uh, just a few seconds before six o'clock uh, on the West Coast. Um, I, I want to just take a second just to thank uh, Ron and Mackenzie for running the show here and keeping us on time and uh, working it so smoothly. Um, a real heartfelt thank you to uh, Rich and Anath. Thank you for sharing your advice and thoughts about um, the fellowship year and, and, um, uh, and how things are gone and things you can do better. And uh, uh, I appreciate that both of you guys are available uh, in the, the, uh, the following uh, via email, et cetera. And then finally, just uh, uh, congratulations to all the fellows. Have a great year. Enjoy the process. Uh, there'll be more webinars and information to come. Don't worry. No, this uh, will be online for you to look at in the future. We'll post this uh, via YouTube channel. You get a link of it. Um, and uh, you will also get reminders for all the other things you need to do. So we're going to help you through this process and uh, I'm just uh, uh, congratulate you and welcome you to uh, just a terrific, terrific year. Uh, there will be a quick poll. Hopefully, it's popped up on your um, your site and uh, to talk about the webinar things you'd like to see different um, and better. I'm sure I'm sure we can always make this better. And uh, um, again, have a wonderful evening and uh, uh, stay safe out there. Bye, guys.